I've come to one of the most famous, the most recognisable historical sites on planet Earth. But for all its fame, it remains a deeply mysterious place, an enigma. We know virtually nothing about who built it or why. Stonehenge. No matter how many times I come to Stonehenge, it never loses its sense of magic. It's positioned in the middle of this wide open plain and raised up, looking at this wonderful view all around. And then of course the stones themselves, which have remained upright since they were erected by our Stone Age ancestors over 4,000 years ago. It's a place to come and think about the passing of time, how small and irrelevant our little lives are compared to the generations that these stones have seen. And then of course you just marvel at the construction. It all began around 3000 BC with the ditch and the mound out there. You can just see it there. And then at about 2500 BC, they added these blue stones. Now what's amazing about these is that these heavy stones, each weighing more than a tonne, were brought not from nearby, but from South Wales. They've identified the quarries in South Wales where these were from. And that was done in the Stone Age with no wheels, no axles, no metal tools, the countryside would have been wooded, and they still don't really know how they achieved that. And then from 2,500 BC onwards, you start to get development of this site for about 500 years. So they rearrange the blue stones, and then they add these giant sarsens. And these sarsens were put in a huge circle. The blue stones were then rearranged in a circle, and with an inner circle, an outer circle there. And you've got these great big pillars here, and you've got lintels up there. Now these work exactly like Lego. You have a little knob on top of all of these standing up stones, and then the lintel slots onto that, holding it in place. Where these huge stones came from has long been a mystery, but now we know, thanks to some brand new research. In the 1950s, rock samples were taken from deep inside one of the sarsen stones as part of conservation work. The samples then disappeared. But recently, one of those cores was found in America and returned to the UK. By analysing the rock, researchers have discovered that they came from an area in the Marlborough Downs called the West Woods. The site is 25 kilometres north of Stonehenge, but how the builders transported these huge stones remains a mystery. It's a place of such power now, even though we're used to huge structures and grand vistas. Can you imagine two and a half thousand years BC? This would have been jaw-dropping. Much of Britain was covered by a vast forest, but this part of Salisbury Plain was clear of trees, it's still with the chalk soil, so just the setting would have been spectacular. And then you'd have arrived here and you'd have seen a gleaming white monument. Many of these stones have become darker, they've weathered down, they would have been much, much brighter. So you'd have walked up to this beautiful, gleaming set of stones, even bigger stones forming a structure in the middle with perhaps that altar stone there as the centerpiece. What's fascinating though is that the more research they do on this site, the more they discover. Recent laser technology has revealed something they never thought was possible. That these lintel stones here on top, those are not just rectangular bricks, just each one moved slightly so you create the impression of a circle. They have actually been rounded off so they are in fact a circle. That is an extraordinary knowledge of geometry, let alone stonemasonry for four and a half thousand years ago. Uh, and so, in fact, there's a very, very slight curve on all of these lintels. And they're doing that, they're shaping that with nothing other than smaller stone, stone hammers, with which they're smashing them into shape. So this is the Stone Age. There's no bronze, there's no metal working, there's no iron, certainly. They're using stone tools and antlers. And if you check this out, if you look at all the, if you look at all the pitting on this sarsen stone here, uh, it looks like weathering, but it's not. These are actually the marks of thousands and thousands of strikes with a stone hammer. 
and all of these were individually shaped, rounded off, completed by thousands of hours of craftsmen hitting it with little stones. So one other remarkable recent discovery is they've worked out that Stonehenge is actually on a very slight slope. That side, the east side, is lower than up here on the west. But extraordinarily, the builders have accounted for that and levelled it by using slightly shorter stones here and taller stones down there so that the ring of lintels is dead flat. Now how they do that without a spirit level, I've got no idea. We know frustratingly little about the people that built Stonehenge. We don't know how they were organised as a society, whether it was a one tribe or, or a group that perhaps covered the whole of Britain. There are some clues. These bluestones come from South Wales. That implies that there was a, a, a mode of exchange between the people that live there and the people of South Wales. We also know that in a nearby camp that seems to have been built for the people that constructed this site, there were uh, animals, remains, feasting, uh, had taken place there. And those animals were brought from as far away as the north of Scotland. And so it's been suggested that Stonehenge was not just uh, the product of, of the people that lived around here, but perhaps some kind of effort that stretched for hundreds of miles across Britain, from southern England to northern Scotland and the west of Wales. And that suggests a, a political sophistication, an organisation way in advance of anything we'd ever imagined Stone Age peoples being capable of. Of course, the biggest question of all is what on earth is this structure doing here? And you cannot come here without being made very aware of its positioning in relation to the sun. There are angles everywhere and we know that it is aligned to the solar calendar. At the summer solstice, the longest day of the year, the sun will rise just over that heel stone right over there. And then in the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year at sunset, the sun would have set right between the two uprights of this trilithon here. One of them has now fallen on the ground. That's the lintel and that one though is still upstanding. That's the tallest stone on this site. Look how high it is, and it goes down two and a half meters underground as well. So this trilithon would have the sun setting in between it, and that sun would have flashed off this altar stone here, brought here from the wild country of the Brecon Beacons. And the fact that it's off center, this is the center of the circle, could possibly mean that the winter solstice was almost more important than the summer solstice. So you'd stand here and watch that sun go down, it would flash off the altar stone, and that would tell you that from henceforth, those days were only be longer, that sun was going to be regaining its power and life was going to return to the fields and the forests of these people's world. Modern laser scans have shown us that Stonehenge continued to be important for generations of people long after the original builders had died. This is graffiti or carving of a knife and we know it's from the Bronze Age around 1800 BC, so centuries after these stones were erected here. And the laser scan also showed alongside this knife, there are dozens of ax heads. So clearly in the Bronze Age, it was an important place to come as well, perhaps with a, with a in, in sacred function as well. Above it, you get slightly more prosaic graffiti. You've got people that visited in the early modern period, it looks like, but the most famous visitor inscribed his name on a standing stone just over there. We think this is Christopher Wren. You've got the cross there. So Christopher, the cross, the Christian cross, and then Wren, W-R-E-N, one of the most famous architects in the history of the world who built St. Paul's Cathedral, Royal Hospital, Chelsea, the Greenwich Naval Hospital, all of the magnificent buildings of late 17th century England. And he came here, he was a local boy, and he must have been inspired. And people say, the shape of Stonehenge, the proportions of Stonehenge are visible in his plans for his magnificent domed cathedral 
St Paul's in London. Stonehenge remains a place of inspiration and discovery. To find out about the latest research, I met up with Heather Sabir, a senior curator here at Stonehenge. Heather, presumably what we know about this place is being transformed by the archaeology, uh, the, the satellite technology, what we're able to tell from this landscape now. Absolutely, uh, particularly over the last 20 years, there's been a lot of research going on. Not so much right in here inside the stone circle, but certainly in the landscape. And it almost reflects the development of archaeology as a discipline. You're quite right, the science has moved on so much and there's different aspects of the science. We can now do so much with geophysical techniques, remote sensing, both from the air and on the ground. Um, and the, the, the biological science, if you like, people are examining deposits on pottery and flint and can tell so much more now than we could 20 years ago. Well, because I remember coming, to, when I started to come here and take an interest in these things, you know, as a kid, there was no talk about the landscape. It was Stonehenge, the circle, yes. this was it. And now, when you, every time you hear about this place, it's very much more, it's part of this extraordinary mm -hmm. Neolithic landscape. Absolutely, and that's the one message we hope we get through to everyone through our interpretation and the New Visitor Centre exhibition and everything, that this amazing monument does not stand on its own. It is part of a very complex landscape. It's the biggest stone circle that's known. This one is unique because it's architectural. If we just look up, you can see uh, we've got a classic trilithon here behind us, the two uprights with the lintel, and of course trilithon is just the Greek three stones. But it's, uh, the technology they've used is really quite amazing because this is very dense sandstone. So it really is quite amazing. But one of the most significant things for the research that went into the visitor center was we managed to do a laser scan of every stone and that gave us a huge amount of information on different levels. First of all, it recorded every stone in great detail uh, and uh, prehistoric features as well as more modern features. It gives more information about how it's all put together. And crucially, it confirmed that it is built on a northeast southwest axis, which is what the solstice alignment is based on. It is just so dizzying that the, the technology, the mm. I, I, how, like the mathematics that they had access to. And but when you did... think about it, they probably did have people we would call mathematicians, you know, engineers, uh, astronomers, uh, you know, as well as people who were good at farming and growing crops and, and you know, making lovely decorative things as well. But before I ask about the rest of the landscape, can we just, just talk about the circles just a little bit more? Has anything ever been found with archaeology in here? Are there, are there graves or deposits within this space? Yes, absolutely, because one of the first things that happens is they enclose the space outside the stone part of the monument with a bank and a ditch. And when that was cut around about 3000 BC, it would have been gleaming white on the landscape. And it has two entrances, again, one to the northeast horizon where the sunrise comes up on midsummer morning, uh, and then one slightly to the northwest. And uh, just inside the bank and ditch is a series of 56 pits that are famously known as the Aubrey holes after the antiquarian Sir John Aubrey, who discovered them, and they hold cremation burials. So still, this site is still the largest cremation cemetery known in Britain. And, um, um, after excavations in the 1900s on one of the Aubrey holes, the finds were all sort of dumped back in. Um, but archaeologists re-excavated one of the Aubrey holes and there's been a lot of work done now on that cremated bone. Uh, and because they're prehistoric cremations, th there's still quite a lot of bone material that survives because obviously they wouldn't get the high temperatures that modern cremations would. And so scientists have been able to find out quite a lot just from that one Aubrey hole. There were um, at least 60 individuals, some men, some women, and a few children. And from isotopic work, which is you know analysis, further analysis, uh, it looks as if those people may have grown up on a granite soil, which is why there is a thought that um, they may have been associated with the, where the blue stones are found in Wales, for example. Uh, so, as I say, the science just is fantastic, what can be done today. Wow. I mean, that's <laughs> what really strikes me about this site, is you get a strong sense this is, there's a British component here as well, and uh, pe people from all over the Isles uh, bringing animals here, mm. bringing stones, and mm. then perhaps you know, bringing themselves as well. Mm. And the other thing is, we know nobody was living here. So it's definitely, 
whatever you like to call it, a spiritual site, a temple, somewhere where people are gathering. And because of the shape of it, we're still not quite sure, you know, what actually went on here, whether there were rituals, whether most people were outside. If you think of a modern day cathedral, it's all divided up into different areas. You know, some people might have been in, whether it was more important to be inside than outside. You know, these are intangible things we'll never know, but we can just, you know, use our own belief systems, I suppose, uh, to try and uh, guess at what they were doing. Clearly, I mean, there's so many humps and bumps. Is this, it feels like a very active prehistoric landscape. It is, it's full of archeology, span which is another reason why it was, uh, became a World Heritage Site. And up on the ridge here, you can see a Bronze Age Barrow Cemetery. So these people came after the main period of the stone monument was in use. Uh, and uh, people are buried in those, we think, elite so, of some sort. So and those are Bronze Age, they're centuries yeah. after Stonehenge. Absolutely, yeah. and their technology, they had the use of metal. Quite often you hear about magic metal because of course they could do so many more things with metal than they could with stone. Uh, and so this, the axe becomes a symbol of bron uh, the Bronze Age, almost like currency as well as being, uh, you know, useful tools. And uh, there are axes inscribed on the stones. You can't see most of them with the naked eye, but through our laser scan, we discovered there's over a hundred of them. So Bronze Age people were coming and making their mark as well. And um, the burials are almost on a 360 around yeah. the stone circle and almost as if they're looking into Stonehenge. So perhaps at the time of Stonehenge, people were looking out, but certainly in the Bronze Age, we think people may have been looking in. I know it's not the fashion these days, but I would love to see this big sarse and put back down that lintel so that we could get that winter solstice sunset. Lots of us would, but if you really look at it, Dan, you can see that it's a very peculiar stone. It's obviously broken yeah, yeah. and it had this sort of lip at the bottom. And we wonder whether it actually ever stood properly. It probably fell in antiquity and it's so chunky compared to this beautiful I one. I know, it doesn't look uh, the same. No, does it? it doesn't. And the lintel is on the ground next to you there and you can see how chunky it is as well. It's almost as if it was never finished. Never finished? Yes. Is that because, a new theory? So Stonehenge was never finished? <laughs> well, the jury is still out, to be honest, as to whether the outer circle was ever complete. There's a wonderful Inigo Jones drawing, you know, that shows it very geometrical and completed. But in fact, uh, at this bit behind us, which is sort of the back towards the southwest, you can see that some of the outer stones are not really as tall as the rest of the uprights. So it's, it's quite interesting as to whether, I think some prehistorians think, of course it must have been finished, a bit like the pyramids. And then other people think, well, um, maybe just the coming together and the erecting of these stones, uh, you know, was so difficult that they did it in generations, perhaps, you know, they had a bad um, harvest or something and they ran out of steam. We, we really won't know. But a few years ago, after a very dry summer, some parch marks uh, showed up. So those are marks where you can see there's been something and it looked as if the stone outer circle did carry on. But this particular stone behind us, you can see is not as tall as the other ones. So um, it's still quite problematic to, to try and work out whether the outer circle was actually complete. I don't, know, I don't know how you guys do it. So many, <laughs> well, so many unknowns. Yeah, know. uh, but, but well, uh, but in a way, that's why prehistory is so important because there's nothing written down. You know, we do have to use the evidence to try and work out what these people were doing and thinking. And I'm just looking at the graffiti behind you there. It's, you've got to remember that history had a relationship with Stonehenge. You know, it, it was always an ancient monument to our, to our ancestors. Yeah. Uh, what are the, you know, do we know what the Romans and then the Saxons and then subsequent peoples made of it? Well, I must admit, I think one of the amazing things is that so much of it survives, but I think it's partly because it would have been quite tricky to remove it. Bits have been taken away, we're pretty sure, and bits have been knocked off. But the Romans definitely were in this landscape. There's a big monument called Vespasian's Camp uh, uh, just over to the uh, southeast. 
um, and uh, there has been Roman pottery found within the circles. So they probably came and wondered themselves what was going on, but they respected it. They didn't try and take it apart or anything. Uh, and then later in medieval times, uh, we know that sort of tracks, roadways went past uh, and it turns up in documents quite early on. Uh, around about the ten hundreds with Geoffrey of Monmouth. And then you get all the lovely stories about um, Merlin coming over and putting the lintels on the top and things like that. So there's a whole mythology around Stonehenge as well. And then, yes, this graffiti behind me might be related to the very first image we have of Stonehenge in the 1600s, a Lucas de Freer. He was um, from what is now, I think it's the Netherlands rather than Belgium. Uh, who came and made uh, a drawing of Stonehenge and we've got some wonderful antiquarian images of the stones and not only are they wonderful, I mean, you know, paintings by Constable and Turner and what have you, but they give you quite a lot of information because they're like a, a little time capsule with artistic license, of course, and in the likes of Constable and Turner, but a, a lot of the etchings that were done are very, very useful uh, over the years. Uh, so yes, it, it has a sort of modern history as well as a prehistory. And every time yeah. I come here, I come here every couple of years to talk to you guys because there's always new evidence. There's yeah. always you are yeah. always discovering new stuff. And just recently there was that big story as well. Yeah. Yes, you probably heard that they've found an incredible landscape feature, again just up to the northwest. And um, the Henge site that's known as Durrington Walls is massive. It's much bigger here than Stonehenge, but they find something even bigger again. So, um, and that is all through geophysical techniques, because again, the science is, uh, there's so many different techniques you can use today. Um, and they've been able to plot a series of huge pits that takes in the monument of Durrington Walls, but also Woodhenge, that's another one that English Heritage looks after, which is a smaller version of Stonehenge. And uh, it is thought to have had some stone components, but we think that this circular arrangement uh, of what is now pits held upright timbers. So it would have been a timber monument, um, a bit like Stonehenge, and it wouldn't have been solid, but with the different arrangement of timbers, again, it probably would have looked as if it was like a wall of timber, even though there would have been gaps between them. The recent one, the reason that people are so excited about it is because it, it also demonstrates the ability, the mathematical abilities, yeah. astronomical yeah. abilities of, of our prehistoric ancestors. Yeah, yeah. It's so huge. I think I'm right in saying, I'm just assimilating the paper myself from last week. Uh, it's so huge. I think they feel that they must have had some way of measuring distance. But when you think about it, you know, I'm quite good at pacing out what is now called a meter, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and, and you know, people in the 1960s talked about the megalithic yard and all of that. So, and again, they were just as clever as us. So it's quite feasible that they had some form of counting system and, you know, equivalent of surveyors or whatever, but it still is quite massive. And I, you know. And, think... and what and what would, what would form would that site have, is it like the Woodhenge? They would have just been very spread out, but just, just no, monumental uh, stones or wood? Uh, pits, shafts, whatever you like to call them. I think I'm right in saying they are absolutely massive. Um, so I think uh, the, ex the people who've put the paper together, the archeologists um, who've got the data are still trying to, assimilate it all themselves and decide what it means on the landscape. So just huge holes in the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, but must have had some meaning because the effort it would have taken to to dig them. I don't know if you know at the site of Avebury there's a famous picture of the ditch which is absolutely ginormous. There's sort of like three layers of people standing on different terraces and it's on the scale of, of that, you know. And of course they didn't have mechanical diggers, they were digging with antler picks <laughs> um, but they must have had a reason why they wanted to do it but and what other secrets is this landscape going to give up <laughs> yeah. over the next few years well i think that's the amazing thing about archaeology it never stops you know just when you think you've got the measure of it or <laughs> something else turns up and again that is down to the science and um, being able to do it. we can do so much more today that doesn't need excavation we don't have to go into the ground uh, you know, we can do remote work now and landscape work without actually excavating. <laughs>
that was totally obscure to previous generations. The story of this place is by no means finished. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel. Hope you enjoyed that video. And if you'd like to see more videos where we attempt to try and bring history to life, uh, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Cheers, guys. See you soon.